fantastic fun and actually as you probably found out it's a great way to meet girls uh, <laughs> yes in his memoir, George W. Bush defined you as his closest partner and best friend on world stage. How did you two develop that kind of friendship? Uh, <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, even though we came from very different parts of the political spectrum, he's a Republican, I was in the Labour Party, after 9-11 in America, we, we worked very closely together. And actually, we worked then closely on issues like Africa and uh, even... You know, we had a debate about climate change um, as well, um, and obviously in respect of terrorism. And one of, the things, one of the things that happens in international relations, and again, this is an interesting thing to, to realize, since many of you will be you know, the leaders of your country in the future, is the personal relationships matter. You know, now I, know, <laughs> I know in one way that's obvious, but you know, people often think with politics that it's just about people making speeches and programs and policies. It's also about personal interaction. So if you get on with another leader and you can ha form a relationship, it becomes easier, for example, to have frank conversations when you disagree about things. It's easier to get your two countries to see things in, in a different way. So um, he was a very close partner of mine. And, you know, the personal relationship in politics, it matters. <laughs> Mr. Blair, Mr. Blair, um, let me abuse my privilege uh, for being the host of this program. But I don't now think I'm, you could resist that for long. I'm one of the ordinary uh, viewers here. Uh, you seem to have developed a very good relationship with uh, both President Bill Clinton and President uh, George W. Bush. Uh, but there are some differences. Um, both, you, say so. <laughs> uh, both you and the Bill, Bill uh, were fans of rock music, but uh, when you talk about your friendship with uh, President Bush, uh, you once said that uh, you, say, you said prayers together, uh, and that somehow highlights uh, your common religious belief. Other than this, or what uh, can you tell from the differences? No, event? actually, it was the, the media used to say we, we said prayers together. We never did, by the way. Um, no, that, look, the... the closeness of the relationship came about because of the events that we participated in. I mean, had it not been for 9-11, it would probably have been a very standard relationship. With Bill Clinton, it was different because we were both very much part of a new wave of progressive politicians, you know, on the left, as it were. Bill Clinton was the first Democrat for a long time in the US that really took the Democrat Party and modernized it and I was doing the same for the Labour Party so we it was a different type of relationship with George Bush it was very much about 9-11 and the aftermath with Bill it was more it was a personal political relationship <laughs> right uh, yes are you there yes in the back um, I want to ask that you said that there are young people stirring up social turmoil in Britain, uh, in London right now. And we, if we look at Chile, Chilean students are also take it to the streets in demand of better quality education. And it is also the youth in the Arabian world who are among the major forces in overthrow, overthrowing dictatorship. And as students are actively involved in pushing for social reform, they are also under the risk of being swayed by radical opinions and going to extremes. And as the former prime minister of a country which, uh, where uh, social protest is kind of a common scene, are you very angry when students are taking it to the streets, protesting your policies, or were you actually very happy that they are willing to make a change? And um, also I would like to ask that if your child or even your grandchild one day comes back home and say to you that dad or grandpa, I would like to be part of the social protest to make a change in my country or in my community, what would you say to him or her? Thank you very much. Good, good question. Whoa. A good question. It's a really good question. I'll tell you what I'd say to him, actually. I'll answer the second bit first. What I'd say is... By all means, go out in the street and protest. But it's your right to protest, but it's your responsibility also to have an answer. In other words, the single biggest danger with 
I mean, by the way, I think the riots are really separate from these types of protests against policy and so on, right? But this is happening the world over, and my, you know, one of the things I think has to happen, because this is the new world we live in through social media and so on, we need to get into a dialogue with our citizens where the politicians, in a way, have to be brave enough to say to the people, yes, you protest by all means, but don't just come and protest and tell me, the politician, I've got to sort all your problems out, but you've got no responsibility to sort them out yourself. Right? And that, you know, whenever I say, see someone protesting, I say, okay, that's fine. Now let's hear your policy. Because you're protesting against my policy, but my policy is this, this is why I believe in it. Now you tell me your policy, and also realize a protest is not the same as a government. In some countries where there are protests happening, it's also important that those who are protesting realize that a protest is not the same as, 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 as changing a government, you know, or changing policy. And sometimes the protest is an expression of anger, which the politicians should listen to, but then what is necessary is that out of that comes a policy that's the right policy. Because otherwise, nothing changes. You know, or you, you, you actually go backwards. And, sorry, one final point which I think is really important in politics. The hardest thing in politics, by the way, this is what you'll find in positions of leadership. The toughest thing is this. That you do have to listen to people. And of course you must. But you're also put in a position of leadership to lead, right? So the art of leadership is the combination of listening and leading. When you listen, it's important that those that shout loudest don't necessarily get listened to most. You see what I'm saying? In other words, sometimes what happens, and this is what worries me about this modern idea that everything's determined by a street protest, the fact you're protesting is legitimate, but it doesn't and shouldn't give you a bigger voice than the person who's not, because otherwise you end up in a situation where everybody who's not on the street, they then don't have a voice, and that's not fair either. Thank you. Well, oh, it's me, of course, that's to choose the question. <laughs> so, sorry. Uh, yes, this lady at the end. Come back. Well, thank you. Uh, my question is about public opinion. Well, in your book, A Journey, you said that something to the effect that public opinion is something that um, when you are in favor of it, everything you do will be cast in a favorable light. Otherwise, um, everything you do would be, um, say, uh, criticized. So um, China is usually criticized by the outside world of sometimes compromise or sacrifice some of the public opinion. So my question is, um, in your position as a leader, how do you shape public opinion if there are some strategies? And um, especially given the rise of uh, Twitter, uh, do you think public opinion can be sometimes out of control? Mm. Yes, thank you. Well, I do think that what happens with public opinion today is that, you know, what used to happen when I was first in politics is that a wave of public opinion would kind of build. And then, if it was a big wave, it might be very strong, even a tidal wave. Right? But over a period of time, it would build like that. Today, it goes to tsunami force very, very quickly. Right? And what that means is the politicians have got to be able to communicate very differently today. We've got to communicate very fast, we've got to organize that communication, and we've got to understand that the depth of dialogue that you need with people is going to be different. And people aren't, you know, this by the way in many ways is a good thing, I mean people aren't what we would call deferential anymore with their politicians. The difficulty is this, you see, we were talking about listening and leading a moment ago. And what happens is that everyone always says to the politician, listen to the people. Right. 
And here's the problem. Usually, the people don't agree. <laughs> right, so when you listen to them, you're hearing different points of view. You know, on very few issues, everyone says, well, we all agree. So, I'm afraid in the end, what you've got to do as a political leader is you've got to be prepared to shape that opinion. Yeah, and not just follow it. So, how do you do it? Right. You do it by engaging in a dialogue where you actually challenge people to share the leadership with you. For example, what I used to find is that I would say, here's my public service, right? I'm going to reform this public service. I'm going to spend the same amount of money, but I'm going to reform it. People would protest against the reform, right? And they'd say, you should spend more money, right? So I would then say to them, okay, you say I should spend more money on this service, then I'm going to have to put up these people's taxes to pay for it. And then these people would say, I don't want my tax going up. <laughs> right. So you've got to disagree. So then you say to them, okay, now you understand what it's like to be a leader. Because what I can't do is give you everything you want for nothing. Because that's not the way the world works. So the way you shape public opinion today is you've got to go right down into the people and have that debate and argument. And by the way, nothing else works. Because the way the world is today, those opinions are going to be expressed. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Blair. Thank you. Uh, we have prepared uh, some uh, nice gifts for you. Um, they might be a little surprises. Uh, uh, they are paintings, and the oh. artist is right here. Please, gentlemen. <laughs> Let's open something mysterious here. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that's fantastic, thank you. Well, what's this one then? <laughs> the Chinese characters say, uh, Mr. Tony Blair, the Prime Minister in politics. Uh, this is uh, a footballer, a footballer, uh, young Tony Blair. This, I'm afraid, is uh, right now the current uh, Tony Blair after retiring from politics. Look, I just want to say that I wish I still looked like that.